Good evening, my name is Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. We're welcome to 5604 Maynard. Woo! Most of you have heard this speech before, but I'm going to say it for the newcomers. 5604 Manor is a collaborative project between a workers' defense project and immigrant worker advocacy group that works on issues such as wage theft, health and safety uh, concerns. Uh, Cooperation Texas, a worker cooperative incubator, helps people with training and support to start worker-owned, worker-run businesses. And the Third Coast Activist Resource Center. One of the things Third Coast does is run the ever-popular Third Coast, previously known as the No War List. Those of you currently on the No War List, raise your hands. All right, those of you who are not, the people who just raised their hands are the cool people. You're the loser. <laughs> you can remedy this by putting your name on the sign-up sheet. If you do sign up, you will get one email a week with announcements of events that go on here at 5604 Manor, as well as other progressive community events around Austin. In the interest of time, I'll just say a few more, no, no, no few more words, never mind. Uh, please welcome to introduce tonight's program from the rag blog, Thorn Dreyer! Okay, thank, this has got to be quick. Thanks to 5604 Maynard, a wonderful undertaking and a very important project in Austin. Uh, and thanks to Bob Jensen. I'm Thorne Dreyer. I edit the Rag Blog and I host Rag Radio. Uh, this is being presented by the New Journalism Project, which is the publisher of the Rag, uh, the Rag Blog. Uh, Tom Hayden needs no introduction. I had an introduction, but we've got to hurry, so I'm going to say he needs no introduction, except that for those of us who came of age in the 60s, he was truly an inspiration. Tom Hayden. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. <clears throat> thanks for those brief introductions. Uh, thanks for that advice on the mics. <coughs> and thank you. I'm a target. I feel like I'm in a fiesta. What is this? Interesting. A Buddhist fiesta, perhaps. Catholic. I don't know what it is. Anyway, um, I'm so glad to be here. The, the reason I'm a little bit in a hurry is I came um, a, as a correspondent for the nation to write an article, a third article, on the um, caravan for uh, peace and dignity being led by Javier Cecilia and 80 or 100 victims of uh, drug war violence uh, just over the border. And uh, I'm, I, I can't do anything about it, but I have an interview with Cecilia at 7, not far from here, but I have to be on time for that. Um, but while I was here, uh, I thought there might be an opportunity to, uh, to talk with uh, people in the Austin community. And I wonder how many of you were, were there last night? Okay, so you know, my problem then is I'm gonna have to um, change everything I said last night, right? <laughs> to make up something, let's see. The first item, sorry, I don't know why we have so many mics, but the first item is, um, that I always try to pursue uh, is uh, the gathering of signatures of peace, justice, and environmental activists in different communities around the country. There are, believe it or not, many, many Austins. You are not alone. Um, and I publish a bulletin which I try to make original and informative about issues where I have some expertise and I upload them to the Nation website or the Huffington Post and sometimes to the mainstream media. So you would do me a, a great honor if you would sign uh, for receipt of the bulletin every two weeks and uh, write very carefully because there's a, um, you got a problem? No. Is it me? How's that? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, let me start by saying something about uh, uh, what I've been doing very, very briefly. Um, 
Uh, I haven't been to Austin for a long time, but for the past 10 or 12 years, uh, I have been uh, working relentlessly to oppose the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, the long war to we'll talk about, uh, because of the way they r rob our domestic uh, potential. Uh, and and, and I, I've been trying to do it less as an activist and more as a writer. I'm kind of going back to the days when I was the editor of the Michigan Daily in competition with Rob Burledge, who was the editor of the Daily Texan uh, in Austin. That would be 52 years ago. Uh, and both of us had this strange experience of being interrupted on our way to careers by the emergence of a social movement, the sit-in movement at the time in Austin or in Ann Arbor. And, and I think uh, uh, we still, I certainly still retain the instinct of an analyst and a reporter, uh, and I have a kind of autonomy about myself that was always difficult for me to reconcile with um, organizing movements or participating in movements. The two are closely related, but uh, you might hear, hear me speaking honestly and believe that I'm just being a little too nonchalant about it, whereas if I were here as an organizer, I would be trying to stir you up and mobilize you the way a lawyer does or an agitator does by making the best possible case to touch all your buttons. Right? I'm not that guy. When the occasion demands, I can be that guy. But I have benefited all my life, I think, from an experience that we all have, uh, mine is probably a bit longer than most of yours, of 50 years of participation in one kind of social movement or another. Uh, and realizing that change comes from the margins is almost never noticed by the uh, mainstream media until it's upon us like a wave, is never mentioned or noted by politicians until it comes to their district, uh, comes like a, uh, uh, a miracle, uh, a milagro as they describe this caravan against the drug war, uh, without notice, as if by God's grace, and disappears uh, before we know it without our control. Uh, this is a, the source of most of the good things we have in our lives, this phenomenon of social movements. Our liberties, our equality, our, our gains over the years have always come from this mysterious force, uh, which I think uh, 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 baffles journalists and um, uh, even organizers because even organizers approach it as if they're trying to uh, bake something. You get the ingredients and you put it in a mixer and you organize a social movement. But the ingredients are always lying around and the question is why sometimes they come together. And history will show you if you think for a minute that no one has ever forecast the beginning of a social movement. Oh, they might have said in general, there will be a great movement. But the night before the sit-ins began, there was no, no knowledge of what was to happen the, the following day. The, uh, the, the night uh, when the uh, Iraq war was supposed to be beginning, authorized by the UN, there was no notice until that very day of February 15th of a decade ago when millions of people turned out in the streets. We're talking 200,000 in Montreal at 20 below zero. Half a million in New York. The New York Times at that moment, not having recognized it, on the contrary, uh, having intentionally not recognized it, in the previous months, announced that now there were two great superpowers in the world, the US superpower and public opinion. That's just one example. We've all experienced many in which uh, it comes like a storm, it's recognized late, 
and I think I have become fascinated uh, because of my life experience with trying to understand this process. And as far as being an, an advocate versus an analyst, it's a, a bit of a false dichotomy. I guess what I really started with and I'm ending with in my life is the belief that only if you're involved somewhat, fully committed, uh, but not losing your mind, uh, a committed person can observe at the same time that they act. And that kind of, what they call in academic uh, uh, lingo, <coughs> participatory observation is extremely, uh, extremely important. Uh, it can go to funny extremes. I took a lot of my students to Miami a decade ago. Uh, who, none of them, well, a couple of them had been active, but none of them had really been active. I wanted them to participate in and observe, take notes on, and do a, a survey of the participants in the street demonstrations against the, the free trade zone of the Americas, which you will remember under Bush was being concocted as being a skyscraper in Miami from which free trade would be carried out in 34 countries to the south. It was, a, it was to be a zone. And the protesters were coming from the perspective of the Seattle movement, and they went into the streets, uh, like many of these events. Uh, the outcome was unclear, but what we do know is that the free trade zone of the Americas never happened. Some could say we blocked it. It wasn't replaced with anything. It simply never happened because of the force of public opinion and internal disputes it was in the Americas. So anyway, I've got 15 students down there and, and from all kinds of places, MIT, and, and uh, they're, they're all in the demonstration and the police are everywhere and the, the tear gas is getting ready and people are being shot with rubber bullets in broad daylight and the students are taking notes. And I say, that you, don't just take notes, take notes on what you see, but Ask if you can sit down with somebody, be attractive, draw them in, talk to them, and get them to answer these questions. So they did collect about 100, uh, 150 surveys, but who are the anti-globalization protesters? It's one of the earliest uh, <coughs> survey uh, sheets. But by the end of this experience, as they were doing this participant observation, they were ordered with others to uh, get out of the streets because it was five o'clock. There's no other reason except that it was five o'clock. Um, and and the, the police started coming at them, they started putting up their hands, saying, we are, we are leaving, we are leaving, we are leaving. They're carrying their notebooks. And all of them were arrested with everybody else, beaten into the ground, held down, uh, eyes open, pepper spray into the eyes, dragged away to jail. I'm standing there, I'm the real target, but they don't even know who I am, just some old guy with a camera taking pictures. <laughs> One of them was a very tall African American. I, I think racial profiling worked for him because they didn't really want to tackle the black guy with media around. I don't know why, or they didn't see him. He was the original invisible man. Uh, but they really pounded on the white students and dragged them away. So I'm, I'm left with parents calling, what? What happened? <laughs> Bail? Then comes Harvard University. You did what? Who paid for this trip? Why, why are you in Miami? Well, sir, Harvard, Harvard University paid for the plane tickets. This is a sociological experiment. The students wanted to examine social movements. And and the parents are screaming, I didn't send my kid to college for this. It was a flashback <laughs> to everything I'd seen before, a complete flashback. Anyway, they got out, um, as, as usually happens, most of the charges, if not all the charges were dropped. They came back to Harvard and gave a very poignant presentation 
to their classmates and professors, who I must say were quite um, agitated or nervous about what they had done and why and how it was consistent with higher education. And one of the students said something I'll never forget, uh, and that is that he said he was a Jewish kid from New Jersey who grew up with the experience, because he was in the suburbs, of the police always being somewhere between neutral and friendly towards his presence. And this one 24-hour period in the streets of Miami completely altered his perception, altered his whole being for that one day understanding what it's like to be on the other end of law and order. Uh, and he, he said that it was something that he could never learn how, however many years he spent at university or graduate school. Um, I could tell you 10,000 stories like that from my life, but I, I kind of see my purpose uh, as that, as trying to enter into equations that seem to be fixed and find out what, whether it's possible to change the equation by your own presence and your own participation. There's that famous uh, line from Robert Kennedy and uh, earlier about you know, being a, uh, a pebble uh, in the water that causes the ripple. I think that social movements are somewhat like that. We don't feel the power of our presence because without our presence, nothing would happen. But with our presence, we become a small element, a tiny ripple in something much larger, which is hard to feel and hard to see until much later. Uh, and, and yet, that's, uh, it's, it's almost like saying that real social movements are like a tidal force. Uh, they start with a ripple and become a tidal force, or so I, I, I would like to think. Now, with this uh, drug war, um, I think it's a matter of changing perception. Why well, I've spent most of my life trying to stop wars or avert wars uh, from happening. Um, I'm not a pacifist. I understand the, that there are times when people take up uh, arms and have to be violent. But I think for the most part, violent conflict and wars are brought about by the failure of the establishment, the governing powers, the ruling class, to be ahead of what's coming. Uh, they're frozen in trying to protect their unprotectable privileges and assets. Uh, they close down opportunities for peaceful reform, peaceful political change, elections. They make violence necessary by their behavior. Uh, and in the case of the uh, drug war, I think if we bring this perspective to it, it alters everything. For most people I talk to, the idea of the drug war, the idea of a peace movement being addressed to the drug war, is a strange new idea. They've been thinking more, probably, especially if they're white, about the legalization of marijuana, medical marijuana, other drugs, in a long 40-year battle in which millions of people have suffered, have gone to jail in this country, and they're obsessed with something that will make it legal, or at least not criminal, to get high. And they have many other issues on their mind, but it's kind of framed that way in this country. Um, the reframing is to see it as a a repression that has grown into a war without a declaration of war by Congress that has gone on for 40 years that involves American special forces 
that involves American armed forces, American advisors, uh, that involves the uh, DEA officers, that involves counterterrorism, as taught at West Point, uh, and that uh, uh, allows for a gradual penetration of American military assets further and further south of our border into Central and Latin America. And the casualties are quite staggering uh, when you think of it. Uh, by some estimates, it's 60,000 dead, others 70,000 dead. That doesn't include the wounded, the disappeared, the displaced. In Mexico alone, since 2006. The false perception is that these people must have had it coming. Just as we look at young people in our own inner cities uh, and, and wonder, didn't they just do something to provoke this? As if 60,000 people died killing each other uh, uh, to, to get a, a, a piece of the drug trade as if they're all, in uh, the terminology of the drug war, cockroaches. So when you um, have a war in which the, the fallen, the dead ones, the suffering ones, are categorized as somewhat less than human or probably deserved it, wrong place, wrong time, it deadens the real killing, culturally, is the killing of our impulse to be humanitarian and to respond with justice. Uh, so we have to alter that, uh, that perception. I think it's a combination of a racial perception and bad, bad, bad information. Uh, but but uh, that's where we are. And it's also, I, I think, uh, a problem of perception in thinking that this is all Mexico and Central America. Uh, and the U.S. is only deploying force to keep that madness from coming uh, to the forests of Northern California or the deserts of Southern Texas or Arizona. So we are deploying our military forces defensively against a problem that will be coming our way, uh, very much akin to uh, a guerrilla war against guerrillas who are narco guerrillas. That's why you have the counterterrorism handbook, the manual for dealing with these people. Uh, it always starts with the notion that that you uh, kill the kingpin, the bin Laden, to get at the network of narco terror. And when the bin Laden uh, or the Chaco are gone then somehow uh, the problem will be eased, the villains will be taught a lesson, and uh, will be able to restore stability and law and order. The problem with this, whether it's in Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Mexico, Central America, is that uh, from a military point of view, there's a small handful of us who argue with evidence that when you target and demonize and kill the kingpin, you set off a rivalry between different factions to take over the operation uh, in the vacuum left by the kingpin. And so the, the killing of the kingpin actually creates the, the hatchery for more uh, would-be kingpins to grow, more factions to grow, and the evidence is more violence results after. Uh, I'll give you one example. I have a, a friend, a very close friend of mine in Santa Monica, who's in the uh, in Army Special Forces, and he, he was in uh, northern Iraq on the day that the um, uh, United States government killed bin Laden in Pakistan. And, and uh, he, he said that he, that he and his troops were never hit harder that morning than their whole stay uh, in Iraq. Uh, he saw his buddies killed before his eyes. He, he twisted and wrecked his knee, diving for cover, didn't get hit. And it was all just the initial retaliation for the killing of bin Laden. 
just a just a counterattack to prove we are still here and we can tear you apart anytime we want. You think we're pacified? You have no idea what's out here. And it would not stop. It was 24 hours of relentless attack on his position. Well, you multiply that and you begin to see the pattern. So these are all the kind of illusions that lead to an impasse. I think that this caravan is very important um, in the history of the peace movement. It's, it's, it's somewhat uh, similar to the emergence of Vietnam veterans against the war uh, in 1967. I say that this way, the core of the caravan, 80 or 100 people coming from Mexico, for the first time I know that Mexicans have marched on the United States. Uh, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they, they say we're only marching into the area that used to be Mexico. Uh, and they just say it's a binational reality. But the, the thing about them is that's similar to the Vietnam vets is their personal suffering. Uh, and their feelings of abandonment and humiliation. We're talking here about people, there's one seven-year-old boy who lost his parents. Very smart. Got all kinds of ideas for slogans. He's on the caravan. There are people that have found the, the, the bodies of their relatives, their loved ones, beheaded. There, there are people who saw their loved ones kidnapped and executed who experienced the disappearance, the kidnapping and permanent disappearance of their, their family members. Um, people who, um, who lost people that were just innocent bystanders, pedestrians in the street, gone forever. That's different from a movement that is against the drug war in a general way. These are people who are viscerally unable to deal with anything except the violence that has destroyed their families. And the additional humiliation of being treated like all the victims were cockroaches. These are people who um, protest uh, is too simple a word. They have, they're having a therapeutic experience, a necessary therapeutic experience in the framework of a marching, bus riding, outreaching, educating, protesting movement that looks political. But like all great political movements, under it is an emotion that is a necessary impulse. They have, have had their dignity, uh, stripped from them, they have been wounded morally, they have concrete grievances, they want to know where their children are. They march everywhere and hold up photos of their loved ones. They're trying to restore humanity uh, 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 to their family's reputation. And in that, in that sense it's very powerful and not dissimilar to veterans trying to overcome the shame and the horror of what they've been through by demanding that everybody else in our country deal with it. <coughs> that's, excuse me, that's why I think this is a very important uh, movement because it's, it has that root similarity. Yeah, I'm not trying to take anything away from people that organize movements and marches continually uh, not as victims, but because they believe in social justice. But it's different when the, the victims are trying to overcome the victimization, right? Are trying to restore their own humanity uh, in the frame, framework of this movement. And I think that they will be uh, uh, gradually uh, very successful. It, it adds a dimension to the uh, drug controversy and drug debate that hasn't been there 
very much before whether we uh, uh, thank you whether we uh, uh, when we think about it at least the at the OAS meeting a few months ago President Obama and Vice President Biden met with the leaders of Central and Latin America and they were told two very interesting things uh, one will never meet with you, Mr. President, again unless you begin to end the drug war. And two, we'll never meet with you in this setting again unless Cuba is there. So, that's why President Obama got rid of his Latin American advisor, Dan Restrepo, which I think is a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Dan Restrepo, the advisor, shouldn't be scapegoated for a bad policy. But it's a good thing because it opens the possibility that maybe another possibility, uh, another policy is possible. And uh, Biden, followed by uh, Obama, also said, hey, we hear you, let's have a conversation. I thought that was great. They said, of course, in the conversation we would win the argument because drug legalization is, is uh, absurd. But let's have the conversation. Now, many on the left immediately scoffed. They didn't mean it. It's empty. I would certainly, wouldn't you? I'd love to have a conversation with President Obama. It's it's an opportunity not to be not to be bypassed. And when you have whole countries with their elected leaders of Central America wanting to have a conversation with the president, or else with an implicit. The conversation will never continue unless you do something different. I think it adds material muscle to the moral argument for doing something about the drug war. I think it adds people of color. I think it adds indigenous people, uh, families of the incarcerated here in Texas or California, people in the inner city uh, barrios and ghettos to a movement that has been marching for a very long time. I think it widens the movement to end the drug war. And I think it's quite uh, politically effective to have the demand end the drug war. I'll tell you why. Think of the other wars we have uh, tried to uh, oppose, uh, from Vietnam to Central America to the, the current wars. Uh, there's always an argument about what the demand should be and people want to be out or out now, right? But they, they never want to go too much beyond that because it's not clear what the solution should be or what your unity would be in your movement once the troops start leaving, right? So it's kind of left dangling. Uh, and then how to get out and the means of getting out become clarified once it's been decided that it's time to go. Similarly with the drug war, once we decide we are not having a drug war anymore, it costs too much in human life, costs too much in taxes, is utter failure, then that opens the conversation about legalization, regulation, or other alternatives, and how to actually do it. How to actually do it. The key is to close the door on war. The key is for there to be a consensus in this country, in Mexico, that war does not work. And then you get into treatment, legalization, all kinds of uh, other issues, including how to deal with the underdevelopment of our inner cities uh, here and around the world. So I think simply wanting to say no to the drug war and represent 100 people who are exhausted <coughs> traveling all the way across the United States into the nooks and crannies of the underclass of America, winding up in Washington, D.C., just demanding a dialogue, demanding answers, is a pretty good conversation to the president's uh, offer of a conversation. We will see whether that conversation ever happens, but it's coming, and uh, it's in Houston tomorrow. I, almost everything I have to say can be contained just in what I've said about the drug war. I can talk about the war on gangs, the war on crime, 
mass incarceration, uh, the uh, migrant workers, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the war in Pakistan. I, I can talk about uh, many subjects, but in, I've implied what I think on all these subjects but, but by what I have to tell you here. The only other thing I might add after we take some questions now is <clears throat> if you indeed have an interest in the legacy of uh, Port Huron and uh, Students for a Democratic Society and the 50th anniversary of the Port Huron Statement which was issued uh, 50 years ago with uh, in, in, in inclusion by uh, people from Austin, I'd be glad to show you uh, sh some slides and tell you some stories. I have slides that simply show what we looked like when we were 20. <laughs> it, it might be well if somebody can help me because I'm, I'm not sure that I can walk over there and hit the... Uh, um, no, we'll t let's take some questions now on the drug war. <coughs> yeah, or any war. Well, there's so many wars. Which <laughs> Take your pick. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the, I'm going to talk about the war on women. Um, yes. The, uh, this last spring we had a rally in Austin about that, and uh, there were a lot of really terrific signs. But the one that really stuck with me was held by a girl of about 13 that said, didn't my grandma already talk to you all about this? <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go? Um, but so my question to you is, if somebody had asked you 30 or 40, even 50 years ago, what will our battles be in 2012? Would you have thought they'd be the battles that we in fact are having? Because I find myself shocked. That's a good question. How many agree with her? Or do you want me to repeat? <laughs> she finds herself shocked by having to repeat battles. Well, maybe that's the lesson that we didn't know. How can you know at the beginning? Do you remember the suffrage, um, suffragette, the, there's a long article by two women. Is it Carrie Chapman Cat? Cat? Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It's a long, fascinating uh, retrospect on getting the, the, uh, what, the right to vote. And it, I'm paraphrasing, but it goes basically like this. Um, this is a very long struggle uh, through chains of generations and people. It began with women who came before we were born. It will be continued and it will not end until long after our passing. To, to think that it took 100 years to get the woman's right to vote by a margin of like one vote in Tennessee or somewhere. Uh, and it could have gone the other way. And that was a hundred years on top of a thousand years. Should give us perspective. I, 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 we should learn not to be shocked by the permanence of things. Um, it is true that now and then issues get settled uh, for a decade or a generation. But when they're settled by one vote on the Supreme Court or by, you know, a 51-49% difference, you know, they're not really settled. Often the winners uh, typically relax their energy to move on to other things because the achievement has become part of everyday life. Those who lost the battle have more apocalyptic feelings that Satan is further uh, in the room. <laughs> and so they're more animated in the counter movement than the, the people that succeeded in the movement uh, and <coughs> institutionalized their success and went on to other things. I, I don't know any other um, um, explanation. Uh, do you really believe in a Marxism that ends uh, the antagonism by the achievement of permanent uh, communal solidarity? Or do you believe in a Christianity that believes that, that the antagonism will be settled by the achievement of an eternal plateau of heavenly bliss? That's not my experience. It's more like uh, there's a yin and yang in everything, and there's a, 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 
permanent contestation, even over the things that you absolutely believe have been settled. And we see it played out. So I, I don't know how, uh, if, if I believe this is an objective law, I don't know what to deal with it subjectively. Like, why should you spend the last 20 years in permanent psychological crisis fearing that your rights will be taken away if you're not at the barricades every second. It's, it's hard. <laughs> but um, that's the way it is. Uh, so does that help? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> yes, the woman there in the black and then behind. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay, um, the extreme neoliberal economic policies that are being pushed out by the Tea Party, the resurgence of Ayn Rand, Murray, Rothbard, well, what about them? <laughs> Did you think they went away? <laughs> what do you have to say about how much that's taking over our um, it, It's like Christianity. It's, it's funny, the, the, the picking and choosing is, is, is baffling to me. You know, like, uh, I'm no supporter of Ayn Rand. I've read all her stuff. Had to. But she was an atheist. Yeah. Right? Christians and yeah, she's like a, a maniac. But, but, but if you could solicit from her constant ravings this one issue of the, the, the masculinized individual confronting all things, it's almost like she's the original 99%. Uh, so, yeah, people twist their icons into their use. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry about the private schools and the conservative universities that teach this stuff as if it's a foundation for the revival of unregulated capitalism. Um, it's, it's also a foundation, in her case, for uh, unregulated atheism. <laughs> and why, why are we uh, leaving that out? Take that, Paul Ryan. Huh? Take that, Paul Ryan. Take that, Paul Ryan. Yeah. Yes, sir. So along those lines, I think there's probably a way for the, what used to be the new left, and now whatever we are, to ally with libertarians in some way. Could be. If we wanted to, for instance, reduce carbon output, we could eliminate subsidies for all this corn that's being sold. Well, I don't know about the left, but certainly the libertarians are caught in the same um, problem, which I, I would describe as a dogmatic uh, loyalty to a framework, without exception. Uh, and, and that's why they're able to pursue their positions without regard for any consequences, because they're not empirical. They don't take into account the the evidence for what you do if you follow their lead. For instance, in the case of my good friend Ron Paul. Um, You're kidding, right? <laughs> no. Well, I correspond with him. He's like a. Uh, I, I'm I'm in, I'm trying to stop these wars. He's been very very helpful. Yeah. In in trying to stop these that. wars, yeah. but. But you know, if, and, and on the drug war, he's fine. But because he has this libertarian framework, he insists on believing things that he just shouldn't. All he would have to say is, well, times have changed and I've, I've adopted to that. For instance, if, if he were here tonight, we could ask him in civilized conversation, Mr. Congressman, do you really think that in Austin, under your program, all black people should be kicked out of all stores and restaurants so they can be resegregated because it's the absolute unconditional right of the owner of the store to refuse service to anyone for any reason whatsoever. I think an honest Ron Paul would say, well, you know, I was wrong about that. But because he's ideological, he can't say that. He doesn't really believe that, you know, all black people should be eliminated from Austin stores. Does he? No. He's so fanatically committed, as some in the left are, that they're the opposite of what I started talking to you about, which is participant observation. 
if, if you start seeing everything through your filter, you will filter out what you don't want to see. If you start with a general filter, open to correction, and you see that actually, you know, there was a debate about the owner's right to refuse service versus the human right to equal treatment under the 14th Amendment or the First Amendment, then you could make a rational decision. Do you favor uh, the absolute owner's right or, or do you favor a more democratic view of uh, uh, sharing space and opportunities? And, and, and you move on, but I, I, they can't do that. And the Republican Party is, is really um, filled with people like this um, who will only learn the errors of their ways at our expense, I think. Yes? So I'm curious about uh, how bad the war reportage has been about our uh, glorious military <coughs> adventures and the uh, points abroad. And in particular, uh, nobody, particularly in the all-weekly press, has bothered to write anything about the uh, wars. Uh, the Austin Chronicle, for example, hasn't put a single article about the wars in, it in a full decade. And the people behind there were all against the war in Vietnam. What's stopping them? Why aren't fundamental questions like, these wars do not have a military or political objective, so what does that make us getting asked? Chronicles part of the new generation. Uh, it's a it's a tough one. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My. Um, was well, true across the board. Well, no. The, but the thing I want to say is this: it was. I don't remember a single mainstream newspaper editorializing in favor of withdrawal from Iraq. There surely has been not a single mainstream newspaper editorialized for getting out of Afghanistan. This has something to do with the organizational culture of our institutions and lines you do not cross uh, if you're going to get ahead. It has nothing to do with logic. There's two sides to every question, but there's only one side allowed here. So it has something to do with the culture uh, that cultivates in journalism this uh, failure of nerve to say no to any particular war until some military validator already has done it for you. And then they all fall into line. So what's interesting to me, going back to what I said about social movements, is that 60 or 70 percent of the American people are for getting out of Afghanistan now faster than the Obama 2014 deadline. The same was true in Iraq. And what fascinates me is how is public opinion so anti-war when they don't get any of it from the television or news they watch? Where does it come from? It, it has to come from that experience that I was talking about. Um, the collective experience the word of mouth, the assemblies, the alternative newspapers, um, the collected uh, wisdom from Vietnam still hasn't ended. People have turned against it despite the fact that nobody in official circles has told them that it's all right. So I, I can't tell if the situation for us is good or bad. It's both. Um, th there is absolutely no pressure to continue the war in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, Iraq is so yesterday, it's frightening. It's like shamefully frightening, but it's also true that it, they, there's no going back there. So we do, we do have to evaluate our victories more closely than whether or not they appear in newspaper headlines or announcements. Otherwise, will never feel we're having an impact on anything. I, I'm not, I don't think I've told you tonight that I believe in winning anything, but I believe that movements have impacts that often movements don't notice until later. And, and uh, we need to watch that. Uh, just jumping to another issue on green energy, uh, Obama and the Congress, I guess it was the Democrats in this case, when they put through the stimulus, 
that no one talks about anymore. Stimulus is a worse word than socialism, or it's part of socialism, apparently, from the Republican <laughs> viewpoint. So you don't ever talk about stimulus, but there's $211 billion of stimulus money flowing right now into energy conservation and renewables that would not have been there without that bill. And there's no taking it back. You can get into arguments about uh, solar scandals or whatever you want, uh, oil drilling, but there's $211 billion that wasn't there. And on the ground, that means a big difference for people that want to hire people to weatherize or caulk or start a business uh, installing solar collectors or invent some uh, uh, machine that will uh, outrace photosynthesis in the production of electrical energy or whatever. Everything I just mentioned is funded. Even the part about beating photosynthesis is funded. So that, I, I take that as a gain in a process. But sometimes it's, it, it's invisible to see because you see the war going on over energy. And, and because I have this experience that I've had, I try to keep my eye on what we've got and how to hold on to it, and what are the lessons, and how do we how do we move farther? That's that's uh, how I see things, and it's extremely difficult uh, if you're a reporter, where it's all like following a game. How would you, you know, they want to declare that the solar program is a failure, or Republicans attack solar program, but somehow in their mind, it's not newsworthy that 200. 211 billion dollars is now being spent on installations and weatherization and conservation that's going on in Texas, going on in, in the reddest of states, uh, and it's not news. It's only if somebody attacks it that suddenly becomes news. Yeah. Um, as uh, as someone who was uh, part of the Chicago Eight, uh, unwillingly, un unwillingly, of of course. Um, what are your feelings on the recent uh, extreme um, punitive uh, actions towards the anti-NATO protesters, in particular the five men who were, are being held on collectively, I think, over $5 million bond in Chicago right now? That'll be dropped. You think so? <laughs> I, I'm just offhandedly saying that. I, I, I was there. Um, the, uh, the faction fights in the organizations are god-awful. They remind me of the worst <coughs> tripping of the 60s. But the, the movement in the streets was pretty amazing. It was beautiful. Whether it was 10,000 or 50,000, there's a big debate about that. But they were brave because they were marching into government forces that were well-armed, that denied them permits to the last minute. Um, there were nurses marching in their Robin Hood outfits, and it was it was a pretty it was a pretty impressive turnout. Um, but there's been a pattern since Seattle, uh, with each and every one of these staged confrontations. I don't know if you've had one in Texas. It's always at a, somebody's convention, and Seattle really flipped out the uh, the government and corporations uh, because. They didn't see the movement coming, as I tried to say earlier, never do. And so they overreacted to this movement that shut down Seattle and undermined their authority in Seattle and challenged the uh, WTO in Seattle with a formula led by law enforcement to be applied to all future Seattles. And I used to keep a a blog on this, it's probably up to about 20, do you know, I have, I can't keep straight the Cancun, and there are just so, so many of them, Miami, the one I mentioned. And the, and the formula goes like this, and it works like a charm. You, you have the Justice Department and the FBI advise the police and the mayor that 50,000 anarchists with black block, black block uniforms on will be descending on your town from Seattle, that's like the new Moscow, or from the last place, wherever the last place was, they'll be descending. And your police department will be overwhelmed just as Seattle's was completely overwhelmed. 
Therefore, we give you $50 million up front to spend as you wish on law enforcement reinforcements. We have a sample of things that you can buy, uh, uh, canisters, dischargers, uh, rubber bullets, uh, uh, pepper spray in advanced form, uh, gas masks, uh, high-tech equipment that someday will be necessary which will turn all demonstrators to jelly in a, in, a, in a sudden blast. They won't hear, but we'll drop them in their tracks. All coming your way, uh, and here's a list of contractors. And, and second, they say, uh, whatever you do, don't give these people a permit. Uh, uh, apparently, permits cause riots. Uh, do not give them a permit, except until the last second. Uh, have them on pins and needles all the way because that will keep people from coming because they'll be afraid their children will be crushed. So that's a good idea. Don't let them have a permit or the children will come. Hold off on the permit. Uh, and then uh, third, uh, t take our tactical advice. So your police department is effectively um, a counterterrorism unit of the FBI and we will deploy you. Um, I know all about this because when I was in the Senate, I discovered a secret memo about the convention in Los Angeles where the FBI was saying this to the LAPD and uh, they were trying to get secret money from the state of California to augment the federal money. And this is a per permanent cookie cutter approach to these events. What, what you then find on the, the, the week before the event that a group of conspirators who, who might be making home brew are arrested as violent uh, anarchists and it's in all the headlines just automatically and then what you find a year later is that in 95 percent of the cases the charges never came to trial there were no guilty verdicts uh, they were released on recognizance charges were dropped usually because the ACLU is mounting a multi-million dollar suit against the city. The feds have left, but the city is responsible for every injury to every demonstrator, every eyeball that has been uh, damaged by pepper spray, and it costs a lot of money. That's why I jokingly said it will probably be dropped, because it always seems to go that way. Now, it could be that these five people are real terrorists, they really have the goods on them, they really have the evidence, they're ready to go to trial, they're certain that a jury will convict. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I no, think no, there's, there, there's they'll no hold them for a while and they do what is done in the name of our great constitutional system, they will plea bargain. Well, I'll give you a misdemeanor, don't bother us anymore. They'll start a plea bargain. Well, I, I hope that happens because one of them was almost beaten to death in jail a few days ago. Well, yeah. I mean, they put you in jail if something like that happens. That's like not their fault. By guards. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. What would ending the war on drugs look like? We don't need to know that yet, but I could uh, tell you that it will be complicated and... Um, variegated, you know, like Uruguay wants to become a marijuana republic and grow marijuana on state-owned lands. The cartels don't like that idea. Some of the middle-class people and voters think that's going a bit far. Um, but, but there's a spectrum, like they think there's a lot of money to be made here in Uruguay by having a marijuana plantation. Uh, and, and uh, you know, other people are simply into the, what, what progress can we make now, like decriminalize? Other people are into, how can we divert more of the money to treatment? Um, some of the people in Mendocino and some of the uh, uh, states like Colorado, what are the other states, there's two or three, have medical marijuana yeah. initiatives and legalize initiatives on the ballot. Some of the pot people think the initiatives are too compromised already. So it'll be nasty, it'll be localized, it'll be uh, fully democratic, and 
I think it'll happen in, um, if it happens, it'll happen in stages to a point where um, it gradually won't be noticed much anymore. But right now, the, the counter movement I mentioned that gets much more hysterical is really on, you know, like they really don't want Oakland to compete with Uruguay in growing marijuana. <laughs> they really, that's like a threat to national security apparently. They, they really don't want marijuana dispensaries. I didn't know there were so many enemies. It's like communist cells 50 years ago. They, you never know who in the room uh, you know, is, is running a cell. But th I think that this will run out of steam, this hysteria. I just, I, you can just feel like people are uh, becoming exhausted with this argument that goes on forever, but it only produces new headlines for stupid politicians that want to uh, declare victory, but the, it just keeps going on. So I, I, I think we've, been spo we've spent so much time on the debate about prohibition that we don't have enough time. We need a teach-in format. We need an endless discussion about how to legalize, how to regulate, how to tax it. Should there be advertising that should be prohibited? Uh, should, should it be prohibited for growers to contribute to politicians? Uh, there's, there's 10, 20 good questions that I think should be handled by the states uh, or communities and to some extent by the feds, but it'll come, uh, I think, by that, uh, that process. Yes, way in the back, the farthest back. Uh, not right, but down the street, probably. So, Correct. What's the hope for bringing in the gun companies? It's a battle to be fought. It's one of those battles where we're in the argumentative stage up against the uh, Second Amendment extremists. Uh, and so there will be no, no victories until we win by surprise sometime down the road that I can't predict. But the argument would be uh, that elements of our government are aiding and abetting gun traffickers who are arming paramilitary units on behalf of cartels that are sending drugs to America for our consumption. Is that not a state of emergency? I would take it completely away from the Second Amendment. And just it's a state of emergency under any sane policy. Uh, just as Eisenhower sent the armed forces to Little Rock to desegregate the schools, the President of the United States should send our armed forces to the border to stop any gun dealer in Texas or Arizona uh, from allowing any weapons to go south of that border. Just, just the, the idea that that might be discussed might be a deterrent, but um, other than that, it, it's just um, it's a process that continually undermines the uh, possibilities of peace and leads to uh, death and destruction, leads to gr enormous Mexican hatred and hostility towards the United States. Uh, you're sending they say you're, you're sending us these illegal guns, so we, we supply you with uh, illegal drugs for your people, and then we die. That's why I think in addition to the, the pro and con arguments, if Latin America turns against this policy, it'll force a re-examination. It'll add muscle to the moral argument. No president can just say, I have to sustain this drug war policy even if 34 countries in Latin America refuse to meet with me until I do something about it. it it's up to Latin America and Central America to really do something. A couple more questions. Yeah. Is that 615? I can't quite see. Yes. Good? Mm -hmm. Thorne, when do you think we should end? We need to be there at 7? Seven? 7. 20 hours? 15 to quarter hours? We can get there in 10 minutes. I want to take a few more questions. I want to show you these slides. What time is that? 6.15? 6.15. Yeah, let me show you some slides, but go ahead. Uh, 
A year or so ago, there was a book that made the case that uh, NAFTA created a lot of the drug problems by, by creating economic uh, flux in Mexico and bringing people to the border, and then the factories moved on to China, uh, creating unemployed people on the border. I share that view. What, what kind of role do you feel that free trade has, uh, and, and what can we do about that? Well, I'd rather talk about the politics of it. I think, uh, you know, Obama was ready to support um, a revision of NAFTA. I know what they were going to do. Uh, whether he did it for political reasons or policy, who knows. But he was going to do that. Then his advisor told the Canadians that that was just for campaign rhetoric. We didn't, we're not, we're not going to do it. And I, I think it's because um, I'm going to say this very, very carefully. Um, the AFL-CIO chose not to go to the wall with the president on NAFTA. They got Hilda Solis as labor secretary. They got hundreds of millions of dollars to enforce the law, uh, unpaid wages for immigrant workers. You know, every one of our institutions, including the labor movement, has its demands, and uh, stopping or changing NAFTA was not at the top of labor's list. And environmentalists have brought it on. You'll remember that the, uh, uh, not the Environmental Defense Fund, but the, uh, what's the litigating national organization of environment? National, uh, NDLC? NRDC. Right. NRDC advocated for, for free trade, they, they um, advocated for NAFTA. They were the front group for the liberal wing of the Democratic Party that opened the way for Gore, that did it, that opened the way for Nader, and you know what then happened. But that's a side story. But that, that's what happened. And, and so we don't have a powerful force in the US anymore except the Tea Party that's against NAFTA. Teamsters, yeah, the individual unions, yes, you're right, but not enough. Okay, one last. Yeah. Uh, Latin American governments have been changing, electing electives, many of whom were tortured under the generals in the 70s. Uh, you talked about Uruguay, the president of Uruguay is a former Kukumaros. Right. Uh, Chile, Brazil, uh, and certainly you name it. Born, all of them. How is that going to change the drug war? If, if the countries we're fighting within will no longer allow us to, will that change us eventually? That's my hope. Um, that's what I mean when I keep saying it adds muscle to the moral argument, but we don't know. Um, what I want to know about uh, Latin America is what happened to the solidarity movements. This, this part of the country was full of people that were hiding refugees from El Salvador? Was it because those refugees were uh, considered morally pure against dictators and death squads? Uh, and the victims of the drug war are impure, uh, contaminated, morally questionable? What is it? We do have the ability, if we see it straight, to oppose this drug war. On Latin America, I, I have to tell you, I mean, my strategic focus is on the Americas. It may be because I've lived in LA for 40 years and you don't just get loopy in LA. You notice where the hell you live. You might have noticed as well. <laughs> and so to me the Americas are far more important than the Middle East or Europe or Antarctica or Southern Africa. Not in a moral sense but it's because as a practical matter it's where I live and I, I'm more responsive to the vibrations in my setting. And uh, if you want to save the world for democracy, wh why is it that the neocons are going off in the Middle East uh, but are, seem to be freaked out by the democratic election of a radical in Venezuela or Uruguay? They won fair and square. And why when Obama said he wanted to shake the hand of uh, Chavez, it was considered like 
the greatest faux pas in diplomacy he'd ever made, and he, he, he was immediately smuggled away to another room and not allowed to... What is going on? I think we need to uh, read Greg Grandin and a few other uh, people who have written histories about this, but um, my approach to the Americas, looking for some strain in our history that can be connected with, would start with uh, Lincoln and Juarez. It would start with uh, Lincoln opposing the Mexican War and befriending Juarez. It would go from there to um, the 1930s and Roosevelt facing the coming of fascism, making an alliance with Latin American countries, agreeing no more direct military interventions, and standing up against the oil industry in support of the Mexicans nationalizing their oil industry in 1937. It was called the good neighbor policy. So there are roots in our history where there has been, for strategic or other reasons, an alliance between progressive democratic forces in our country and the countries to the south. And that seems to me to be a, a whole area that American politics is blind to. Even on the issue of Cuba, what is going on? I, I don't think it's as simple as some Cubans in Miami hold the Trump card and can veto the election of a president and therefore will never recognize Cuba. Really? 60 years? Every other country in the world uh, but us? Uh, do, do we want the casinos back? Well, we can't say that. But what on earth? It, there is something wrong fundamentally in our cultural DNA that makes us hard to admit a mistake against a so-called lesser power. <coughs> we fucking recognize China. <laughs> I don't hear anybody going to war with China. <coughs> so it's, there is something that has to be straightened out in our origins. Uh, uh, and and if, we ca if we can get that straight, it leads towards social equality, opportunity, uh, respect for human rights and democracy. But uh, if you take the national security establishment, which I pay a lot of attention to, read Foreign Affairs magazine, it's all about Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, the gold standard, whatever. The person in charge of Latin American policy for the Council on Foreign Relations is a young woman who comes out of a progressive background. She covers everything. She's had three meetings with the president of Brazil. She's in charge of Cuba. Her unit at the Council on Foreign Relations consists of two people for all of Latin American policy. That's the think tank from which comes most of American foreign policy. Two women. That's it. So, I don't know what they're doing at the LBJ school here, but I, I don't mean having Latin American studies departments that connive with uh, neoliberals about how they can get back in power. When I was in Harvard uh, uh, one day, there was this rebellion in Bolivia and they threw the, uh, the, the president of Bolivia out because he had massacred a bunch of people. And I'm sitting at my desk and this administrator comes into my office and he, he says, uh, we've got paperwork here to admit, um, what's his name, the, the outgoing president of Brazil uh, to the Harvard Institute of Studies, political studies. He would have been on my hallway it's just a place that dictators go, where they have a, a, when they need a you know a new respectable card and perch. And I said the fucking guy just killed 110 people. And the administrator looked at me. He says, "Yeah, that would be inappropriate." <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped him from getting get, getting to Harvard. He probably got to Miami. But he was the candidate of James Carville. The Democratic political strategists were the consultants 
for the neoliberal candidates in Latin America. Was, it, was that just to get a job? They have the money, Tom. Is, is that all it is? I think it's in the DNA. It's something about protecting the Monroe Doctrine in spirit, in spirit, if not reality. Let, let me quickly show you these slides. Can I? Yes. I don't know if we have any time, do we? Yes. yes. Well, no, because if you want to buy a book, you've got to leave. Because I have to go. Who wants to? So you're right. You need to move your chair like over there. I'll move my chair anywhere you like. Away from the light. Yeah, so you're not, so the light's not <laughs> shining. Not okay, my ass. Right. <laughs> so you tell me when to push the next button. Go ahead. Push a button. <laughs> That's the Port Huron statement. 25 cents. Original form. Next. <laughs> 35. That's me being beaten up. That's not just to uh, publicize my um, revolutionary past. It's this is when I was conceiving of the idea of the Port Huron Statement. This is December 1961 in Mississippi. From there I went into the drafting. Next. This is uh, on the right, Charles McDew writing with a t-shirt that says, A Negro is a Terrible Thing to Waste. <laughs> he, he was with me on that day in Mississippi. He became the first chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The point I'm trying to make is that the idea of participatory democracy and Port Huron really started with the direct action campaign of black and white students in the South, including my first wife, Casey, here in Austin. Yes. And they were in, they were at Port Huron. Port Huron is usually blacked out. But there was a SNCC delegation there that came to see whether participatory democracy meant we would put our bodies on the line or just our words on a piece of paper, so to speak. That's Martha uh, Prescott Norman, who's a University of Michigan student who at the, uh, at the time uh, typed the Port Huron Statement, or claims to have typed it. <laughs> this is Maria Varela, who was then Mary Varela. She's a longtime lead organizer in um, northern New Mexico. Um, and uh, started the um, literacy project in Selma, Alabama. That's Casey Hayden, that's Sandra Kaysen, who is my wife in Austin. That's me, <laughs> the eligible bachelor <laughs> at age 20. That's us, we don't have any pictures, we didn't believe in pictures apparently. This is not Port Huron, this is the nearest this is Bloomington, Indiana in 1963. There are no pictures of Port Huron that I've been able to find. So who are some of the people? Uh, that's Rob right there from the Daily Texan, Rob Burlidge. Uh, Sarah Murphy from New York City. Where is Rob now? Is he... Rob's in New York doing health work. Is that Bernadine Dorn? That's Rennie Davis. No, man, no, Bernadine Dorn was a teenager then, yeah. Is that a Todd Gitlin? Right? Yeah, that's, Todd doesn't have his fist up, you notice that. <laughs> okay, next. That's Bob Moses and Bob Zellner and Jim Foreman. Uh, participatory democracy and the plan, there was a political plan which was to push the Dixiecrats out of the Democratic Party, make it a more liberal party, and uh, empower blacks to vote uh, in the South, which would destroy the base of power of the Dixiecrats, who controlled all the congressional committees, as you may have forgotten. Uh, Stennis was from Mississippi, Eastland was from Mississippi, etc. So the plan was not just moral defiance and direct action, it was to dislodge a branch of the power structure in order to uh, uh, develop a more liberal political agenda, I guess you'd say. That's Al Haber, uh, who was the, um, the uh, sort of the founder of SDS in 1960. Wish you had a picture of him now. <laughs> that, we'll get to that. that okay. That's Sharon Jeffries, who is, um, she was in the Ann Arbor chapter, and her mother uh, was the, a leader of the uh, United Auto Workers and, and solicited the UAW to give us the camp at Port Huron, which is why we met there. 
uh, as usual in movements, we didn't know where we were going to meet. Um, and Sharon uh, now uh, is a new age uh, proponent living in, I think in Carmel, California. Jim Monsonis, this is a very funny story. Um, he, um, he, he came to Port Huron as the head of the National Student Christian Association. And with Maria Varela was, and my wife, we, put, we were put in charge of writing the platform on spirituality. Because we were taking on one institution after another, claiming that they had been hollowed out and failed, and proposing how we would move forward with a new approach, new doctrine, new spirit, which would have been liberation theology. So there was these long, endless meetings uh, about our moral, the definition of our moral position at Port Huron. And people were making good progress. They were debating existentialism, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, atheism, on and on and on, continually, and then staying up all night. So at the end of this process, five, six day process, Monsonis fell asleep. And so the section of the document on religion did not make it into the final version. It will be published for the first time in late September in, in a collection of writings with the long explanation by Monsonis. He's now 75 years old and taking a well-deserved vacation in Spain. This is Paul Booth who is the, uh, still the organizing director of uh, AFSME, in charge of a lot of their public uh, sector organizing campaigns over the past 40 years. He was a national secretary of uh, SDS. He, along with many other people, came to be seen as reformists, which is like, uh, on the left, a word that's kind of equivalent to satanic on the right. <laughs> and, and so he, he went on to the labor movement, where he stayed forever. Uh, this is uh, the late Paul Potter. He, he was one of us. He was a roommate. I don't know why he wasn't in um, Port Huron. He was at uh, Oberlin. And he, he gave a very famous speech at the first SDS anti-war rally in 1965 fall, right? The fall of 1965, yeah. His son is a sociologist graduating London School of Economics and teaching sociology in Britain. Al <laughs> <laughs> El, El was there. No, no. It, it, there, were, there were a few people in the room who, that were the great dead ones. They died in 1962 or thereabouts. Albert Camus uh, was a huge influence on the existentialist uh, philosophy of direct action. So was C. Wright Mills of Austin, Texas, a good Irish immigrant boy. Um, he wrote the sections of the Port Huron Statement on the power elite. We were simply plagiarizing his spirit. Um, as he, he also he, he also died in, uh, he was University of Texas though, in the sociology department. Uh, and he had sex with all the students on top of the bookcase in the library. <laughs> he, he died also just before the Port Huron Convention. John Dewey, he wasn't there. <laughs> but he was the head of the board of the parent organization of SDS. And he invented the doctrine, I think, of participatory democracy, which meant widen, widening democracy beyond the ballot box. 